everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Flipping the Barrel, a podcast where we interview leaders in the energy space to uncover and find out more about their careers and their life journeys. Today, we have Marshall Dotson, who is currently the President and Chief Executive Officer at Key Energy Services. Prior to this role, he served as Interim's Chief Executive Officer since 2019. He studied accounting at the University of Texas at Austin, and right after graduating, he worked for several years at Arthur Anderson, then Dynagy Generation, and has been at Key for the last 17 years. Wow, Marshall, thank you for being here today. You have such an extensive career, and we can't wait to just figure out a little bit more about your journey. Great. Thank you, and, and thank you for having me. I'm, I'm uh, looking forward to, to talking and, and sharing some of the life lessons I've picked up along the way. Well, thank you so much, Marshall. And as a native Houstonian as well, I'm really looking forward to jumping right in to really learn about what it was like for you growing up. So let's start with, you know, Marshall, when you were growing up in oil and gas was really not the place to work, kind of feeling like what it is like today. Um, Your dad was an engineer and told you to be an accountant. Uh, There weren't many people going into energy at the time, which created a large generational gap, which is still a struggle in today's workforce. And we do definitely see that. Um, And because of that, you know, can you take us back to what life was like growing up, especially in a town like Houston, where it always was the energy capital of the world, and you were definitely told not to join oil and gas? Um, How did you feel back then about the industry? And uh, what's your thoughts on that today? Yeah. So, you know, growing up in Houston in the uh, the 70s and the 80s, uh, you know, it was it was full of energy like it is now. Um, and then it wasn't. And, you know, I watched uh, friends move away because their their dads lost their jobs. Um, you know, like we've seen different times, houses were half built and they stopped. And the neighborhood we lived in was full of empty lots, which was great as a kid because it gave a lot of places to play. Um but, uh, you know, it, it, you saw the downturn hit really hard. And, you know, my father was uh, in oil and gas and construction. And um, I think he's, he saw what happened to the people around him. He was able to, to stay in and, and stay through. But, you know, when I was going to college, he, uh, he said, you know, you really should study, study accounting because that gives you a breadth over everything and tried to steer me away from energy, but um, not wanting to live anywhere else. But Houston, it's hard to avoid it. Um, so I, when I started at Arthur Anderson, I, uh, went to work for, uh, in what was then an energy group working on mostly empty companies at the time. Um, but yeah, no, it, it's, it was different then because of the, the boom bust versus today. We still have boom bust cycles, but you've also got a lot of the, uh, a lot of the, 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 the conversation around the, the energy transition and people, you know, believing that by 2030 or even 2050, we won't need, you know, hydrocarbons anymore, which I, I think is kind of crazy when you dig into the actual math. You know, it's very common uh, with some of the guests that we've had on who started, you know, 20, 30 years ago they would all hear the same thing that, you know, oil and gas was going to be obsolete in 10 years mm-hmm. and that they should find another industry. And, you know, here they are 20, 30 years later, and we're still kind of having those conversations. So to your point, it's it's going to be a very long time before we aren't dependent and won't need the oil and gas industry. Um, so we wanted to get into kind of a part of your career where you graduated and right out of school, you got a job as a CPA. And, uh, you know, your father, again, was very pushing you to go into finance, to be a CPA, accounting kind of role was, you know, what you were inspired to go from your father. And, uh, but you ended up working, you know, 80 hour weeks, no breaks, little rest is a very, you know, high pressure kind of, you know, industry. And it wasn't exactly what you envisioned. And, you know, this happens to a lot of people who graduate and then they get into this job and they're like, this isn't what I thought I was going to be doing for the rest of my life. You know, how did being a CPA teach you or really define your leadership style today? Uh, it, it was uh, it was an interesting journey. And it's funny you say that because I've, I've looked, you know, looking at my daughter in college, she wanted to go into accounting and finance and she was struggling in some of those classes. Um, but she took some computer science classes and I'm like, and she was getting, you know, knocking out of the park. And I'm like, Bailey, maybe you should do uh, computer science. Um, and so she 
kind of did both. Um, but you know, when, when I, when I, when I, and I had the same journey with, uh, you know, doing well in the accounting classes and you could get a job in, uh, the nineties in that. Um, but as, as I got into it, um, you know, I think, I think a couple of things came out of it. One, a, a work ethic, um, in terms of, uh, you know, when you're when you're in that environment and you're you're constantly working, um, you know, it, it becomes habit. Um, but frankly, it also becomes a hard habit to break. It took many, many years for uh, my wife to finally get through to me that leaving the office at seven o'clock at night was not leaving early. Right. Yeah. But that, that was so ingrained in me. Um, that uh that that was a challenge but some of it was uh getting through that was was perseverance and then as i move through i think everybody starts off you know you you don't know what you don't not know right and so it takes a long time and a lot of repetition to kind of then move into something that that does feel more intellectually challenging and that does kind of and then you can look back and see how much you've learned and grown and and i think that's that's something that that's motivating when you can actually stop look back and say wow i i learned a lot and and then you look out and there's so much more you don't know and then you just got to kind of keep chipping away at that so uh you know you gotta you gotta stick with it um you know that's the that is the the one thing i've learned is is uh you know you stay through the, the hard times to see the good times mm. and i think that really goes into your full story because you learn that working those 80 hour weeks and you thought, you know what, I don't really want to be an auditor anymore. And I'm going to leave the firm that you were working at at the time was Anderson. And you went to Dynagy thinking that it was going to be a lot more stable, you know, no more 80 hour weeks. Uh, And then day one, (laughs) when you actually started work, uh, Dynagy was on the headline of the newspaper and it wasn't for a good reason. Um, All within your first year, you saw employees even going to prison. You witnessed like everything unfold. So what you had thought Mm -hmm. prior was a difficult time actually was nothing compared to what was ahead of you. Um, What did you learn from this difficult experience and how did this set you up for your role today as a CEO um, and, you know, having to deal with that with really no prior knowledge on really what to do when your company is in that kind of state? Yeah, so it, uh, it, it I learned a lot of uh, important lessons then. I, I learned the, uh, the real, what really matters is cash. How much cash are you making? How much cash is coming in? And, and uh, you know, someone, someone uh, one of the, the CEO at the time um, told me that, uh, you know, accounting is fiction and cash is fact. And that's, that's very true. And, and, you know, we can get lost in EBITDA and net income. Um, I think our industry has kind of come around to cash and, and how much cash are you generating and, and returns, which I think is very healthy. Um, but, you know, I, I also uh, saw people, um, you know, have their lives changed because they, they did not want to, um, disclose something and you know one of the one of the lessons that that i learned that i've kept with me is if there's something you're, you you don't want to say you're embarrassed to say you 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 are not proud of then that's the most important thing you have to say right whether whether you're dealing with public investors whether you're dealing with your boss whether you're dealing with a board of directors um you know being being transparent as to what's happened why um, even if you don't know why, um, just what's happened so that, so that, uh, you know, you, you can find the right solution. The, uh, what do they say in, in DC, the cover up is always worse than the crime. Right. Yeah. And it, it, but, but that, uh, that, that transparency and, and that, that, you know, need to disclose those kind of things, you know, was very apparent to me during that time. I say that goes both professionally and personally. I'd like to add. definitely, <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> Good one. Um, and, and yeah, I think I'm sure as you reflect through your career, all of these, you know, challenging moments, when you're going through it, it, it seems very heavy and sometimes like the end of the world as, you know, every difficult obstacle that we go through. But what's beautiful about it is that now, you know, when you look back at all of these instances in your life, it's they all had a blessing in disguise because that just made you a better leader. It made you a better CEO in the future that you didn't even know you were going to be CEO. So it's, Mm -hmm. you know, I think it's an important lesson to learn is that no matter how difficult the challenges are, is just look at what you're learning through them. And um, one thing we wanted to comment on is, you know, knowing your limits is very important. And I think especially with the younger generations now, I think 
we're all very ambitious and we want to jump so many levels ahead and we think we can take over the world uh, compared to maybe back in the day where it was, you know, we knew we had to do our time in different levels of the organization. Um, how did you, you know, maybe looking back at your different roles, was there ever a time where maybe you had a little bit of imposter syndrome where maybe you were awarded one of these bigger roles and you didn't necessarily think that you were capable of doing it? Or do you think you any role that you had, you were like, yes, this was my next step. I, I'm confident that I can do this. Yeah, um, you know there, there 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 is no desk guide or manual to being CEO or, or, or CFO. So um, you know when, when I when I, ha- I had uh, an interim that I, w- I was the controller, the CFO at the time left, and they put me in as the interim CFO, and I really wanted that job. And to your point, I thought I knew everything I needed to know and was perfectly capable to do that. Um, but they brought in somebody else and, and, you know, looking back on that, I could, I could look back a year later and say, okay, I didn't know these things, right? Like it, it was, I, I, I didn't know what I didn't know. And it took time and distance and exposure to those other things to, uh, to do that. I think, I think that's, uh, you know, that, that's, that's, that's part of learning, but part of getting through that is also who you surround yourself with and the team. Um, you know, I, I, I very much believe in, in having a, a diverse team, um, in diversity in perspective, diversity in backgrounds, because it's only through hearing all the different perspectives that you can kind of realize your blind spots and uh, hopefully avoid groupthink as well. When, when everybody is kind of from the same background, doing the same things, um, you know, you, you can you can all be convinced in something. Um, but it, you, you need that diversity, those different voices to, to kind of challenge the, the conventional wisdom and, uh, you know, a, allow for the best decisions. Mm-hmm. You know, one, one, one thing when, you, when you're talking about the challenges and, and some of the rough times I've had, the other thing that, that you, you get when you come out of that is no matter how tough it is at work or, or anything else, the, the sun is going to come up tomorrow and it's going to set tonight. And you will get through it. And every experience, good or bad, is an experience. And you learn and grow from all. No, I that I think that is a very bold and very true statement that we need to kind of remember in those moments. Because a lot of times you do feel like it's the end and that tomorrow oh, might yeah. not show. And so I think it's important for those listening to understand that if you're in that today, like, the, like tomorrow will show, things will change. And mm-hmm. With time, everything gets better. So thank you for sharing. Um, And you brought up a really great point that I definitely had seen throughout my career and still see today, which is the people feeling that their job security is really what they know and that they're really reluctant to maybe share experiences. Um, And we see this a lot with, you know, people in the field, too, that really had brought their craft up and maybe they don't want to share And then at some point they might move on and then we lose all of that great knowledge that they have. And that's something that we really don't want to do. Um, You shared some advice to your daughter who just entered the workforce um, and, you know, she had experienced this. So what was some of the advice that you've given her? Um, And also for a lot of women out there, they feel this when they leave, for instance, for like a maternity leave and they're gone for that time period and they feel like they might be replaced. You know, what what did you share with her? Yeah. So, so as she was starting her career, um, I, I, I told her one thing, which I don't think she appreciated, which was that, um, you know, if, if, if you work 60 hours a week and the person next to you works 40 hours a week, after a year, you've got a year and a half of experience. They've got a year after two years, you've got three years of experience. They've got two years. And, and that just grows exponentially over time. Um, but the, the, the other part of it, go, going back to the knowledge, and, and we see and fight that all the time, where people become experts in what they do, and they know every little thing, and they become uh, what they believe is irreplaceable, right? That's job security. Um, but the reality is the, the, the best way to get that next job, that next promotion, is to do it before you have the job. And the only way the, the, well, I guess you could work 80 hours a week, right? And, and try to do both jobs and try to take things from your boss and take on, you know, things away from them. But uh, the, the right way to do it, the way I've had success and seen success is to teach people below you to do your job. Mm-hmm. Um, because, you know, the, the flip side to 
uh, I know this and I'm invaluable is this role in this role is you never get to do anything different. And the opportunities that you could have prepared yourself for um, your, your organization may say, yeah, she's great at this. And if I give her this, then what am I going to do with this spot? Mm-hmm. Right. And so, um, you know, to, to, to me, a, a constant learning and teaching aspect is something that allows you to move through your career. Um, it allows you to grow. I take, I, I really enjoy developing people, giving them new challenges, watching them, um, helping them learn, helping them grow. And, uh, you know, the, the, the only way you can, you can kind of start doing the next job is to have the people working for you start doing your job. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, that, that goes back to, to your point about, you know, women taking time off to and, and worrying about being replaced um, in a lot of time. I don't, I don't know how this is going to sound, but it's OK to be replaced in some ways, because then you can that that means you, you get to take on something new and you've developed someone to take take your role. And, uh, you know, the, the, the other side to that today is they're, they're so, you know, everyone is so hungry for talent, so hungry for good people that, uh, you know, there there's should be a little fear of being replaced in today's environment because, you know, we'll, somebody will snap you up in a heartbeat. Um, I'm really glad that you shared that piece of advice because it's so important. And I see this a lot, especially for women. It's definitely something that women lack. It's called putting your job before your career. And it's in multiple books. There's a lot of blog posts about this. And it's because we're somewhat perfectionist and we want to do a really good job but you stay in that job for years. And then you see other people, like you mentioned, they train someone else to do it. They're thinking ahead, they're moving on to the next thing. But you know, we are so focused on doing that job so well that we don't let others mm-hmm. in, but then you get stuck. And then that's why there's such a big gap in career advancement is because you're putting your job before your career. So I really love that you you mentioned that because that's such a big valuable lesson and it's it's nice to have a dad like yourself to share these kind of things because not everybody gets these little golden nuggets that really can change your career so i'm glad that you shared it with everybody um talking on family life being a father we all know that taking on big roles cfo ceo crazy industry like ours with cyclical with difficult situations it's it's common that you have to step away from the family life for a few months or a few years, depending on on what that looks like for you. You mentioned that there was a point in your life, I think your daughter was three and uh, you were traveling a lot to Midland. There was a lot of business in Midland. You were coming back and forth. Looking at it, you realize that maybe you missed out a little bit on, on that time frame, which is so precious and we don't get back. You know, what is maybe some advice that you can give to those who may be coming into those higher roles where there's a lot of dependency on the business Looking back now, what is something that maybe you would like to tell yourself in, in that year? Was it worth going a lot or thinking maybe you should have a little bit more of a work-life balance? Yeah, um, you know, it, it was actually my, my, my son and, and I, he was, uh, I basically missed year three when I started at Key. Key had just moved to Houston from Midland, um, but everybody who worked for me was in Midland. The, all the work was in Midland. I had to stand up a group in Houston. And it was going to be, you know, a few weeks and it turned into, you know, well over a year. And in hindsight, I should have just uh, picked up my family and moved there um, rather than being absent. And the, the, uh, the, the strain I, I put on, uh, on my family and, and myself because of that. And, you know, it, it's one of those things that I would, I would never ask anyone else to do that after going through it. Um, but, you know, as, as you progress and, 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 you know, the, the demands on your time are such that you, you, you know, you have to go here for a week or, or be gone for, for this period of time. Um, you know, that that's when, you know, the flip side of that should be you have the time when you're not there to spend with your family. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and I try to do that with everybody who works for me. If if we're gone and, and they need the, the time to uh, to go to the baseball game or, or do things like that, then by all means, you know, it's it's about, you know, the, the the you know, what you're accomplishing, not necessarily when you're behind your desk, if that makes mm-hmm. sense. Mm-hmm. What I think is important is that you stated that you you've learned from what you did in your life and you're not inflicting it on others. 
we had seen a lot of leaders who had that same experience where they missed time with their family, but they didn't state that, you know, I'm going to use this moving forward. I, I ensure that my employees and those around me don't make that same mistake as me. And for you to take that and, and understand that, okay, there's other things I could have done and ensure that your employees moving forward, get that flexibility. I think that is the best learning lesson that anybody could have from that experience. So thank you for sharing that. And thank you for being one of those leaders that, that do do that. Um, which really kind of goes into what we were going to talk about, which was not leading behind a desk. You had talked a lot about what it's like, you know, being in the field and being close to your field employees and how important that is. We'd also seen it on social media and kind of the stuff that Key has posted and you have posted as well. Um, can you tell us about the impact that's created with your organization, seeing you out in the field and being involved? Yeah. So, so you know, when, when I when I started as as CEO, um, I've I've now read that people call it a, a listening tour. Because where 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 you would go and I would go out and and still do and you know just start talking to people what what's going right what's not going right what are the obstacles um, because I, I don't think you can fix a problem if you can't see it and so um, you know by by being there being present um, you know it, it it allows for that it's also the 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 one thing we all share um, as people regardless of how much money you make or anything else. The one commodity we all have is our time. And so I think when people see you give your time to them, um, everybody recognizes that. You know what I mean? Like it, it's one thing to 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 send a memo um, or to, mm -hmm. to send an email, but to actually be there in person. Um, I think we all as people recognize the the commitment to them by by being there. That makes sense because mm -hmm. No, no one, no, regardless of how much money you have, you can't buy more time, right? No. If there's only there's only so many hours of daylight in the day. Mm -hmm. And we all yeah. have to sleep. And I've tried not to, but you still have to. <laughs> I, I love what you said about that. At the end of the day, time is so precious. And um, I think it's so crucial for leaders to go to the field, to go to the workshops, to go to the field, like... To the manufacturing centers all of it and not just go and show up but to your point is be vulnerable and be open with your employees about things that you can fix because if you if if you're not listening to them we can never fix it from the office in houston or from wherever your headquarters are so it's really impactful i think when leaders go but not just go and you know barely talk to the employees and just kind of like i'm here because it looks good and i made a visit but it's about sitting down with them and doing those round tables and really listening to what's going on in the field because at the end of the day your our business wouldn't be successful without the people who are out there day to day 24 7 working on the rigs who are working out in the field so it's i i really love all the posts that you do and then when you do show up you you know you you share with the team what's what's going on from from a high level um and so another thing that we have for you was, you know, you're a big advocate for women in the workplace, um, especially with having daughters. And you believe, you know, having a diverse team is key to better performance. You mentioned it before. You've now been in the industry for a few decades. And back then, you know, there wasn't as much push about, you know, diverse teams, about having women in the workplace. So you've kind of been through the whole changes of, you know, no diversity, very little women in the workplace to now there's a big push. Um, where do you see um, the most change that is still needed? And why do you think it's important for men to be big advocates be, um, for women uh, to, to keep growing their careers in this industry, especially because it's still not as common as, or as many women as we'd like to see? Yeah, I, I think we've 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 made a lot of progress. I think I think you see a lot more women in engineering roles in finance roles, um, which which is great. You know, going back to my earlier comment, you know, we uh, you know we, we are short people. We are short people in the field. We are short people in the office. Um, and you know, by not involving women in a lot of field roles, we're missing out on half the population. Right. So so creating the environment where uh, where, where they, they they can come into that workforce, I think we still have a reputation in, in the oil field um, that that we need to overcome. Um, you know, it's it's I mean, you've, you've been to West Texas, you've seen the, you know, the, the oil field trash, you know, stickers on people's trucks. And, you know, who would want to go work in that environment? 
So I think part of it is professionalizing the industry, making it a, a much more open place. Um, and I think, I think over time, we'll continue to make progress with that. And, uh, you know, as you see more, more female leaders as well. Um, and, uh, you know, again, I'm, I'm, I'm all about having, uh, different, different views, different opinions, different backgrounds. And, um, you know, despite what some people say today, there are men and women generally approach things from different angles. And I think that is a, a great, uh, a great, uh, part of a team is to have those different perspectives. No, I, we fully align with that. And it is very true. We both look at things differently, which is what makes it so beautiful um, to have mm -hmm. both on teams and to have that dynamic conversation. Because uh, no matter how we slice it, men and women are different. And I think that is why diversity is so important, um, especially when you're making these big decisions and you want you know, other input. Mm -hmm. uh, which is to end, we'd really like to ask you a question around your father and what he had mentioned when he told you, quote, you're a mushroom <laughs> as you move up into larger roles in the organization, which I think a lot of people would be wondering what he's talking about. But um, it would be really great to hear you know, what that meant to you and how that changed your per perception or like your perspective as a leader. Yeah. So so it was after I got my first vice president role. Um and, uh, you know, we, we went to dinner with my mom and my dad and my wife and probably the kids at the time. And, uh, he said, congratulations, you're now a mushroom. And, and I was like, what do you mean? And he said, well, you're, you're a mushroom. You're kept in the dark and you're fed BS, right? Because that's how they grow mushrooms. And, and it's true, um, because the, the further you move up in an organization, everything you hear is filtered, right? And so it comes up filtered, it comes up spun. And so uh, you may not really get the true story. You, you get the BS, right? And, and you don't see. So that's one of the reasons I'm a, I'm a big advocate of, uh, of being in the field, because then you can see and hear kind of the, the, the true story. You can see what it's really like. Um, the other thing is, as you, as you move through an organization, the way you experience that organization is very different than someone just started in that organization, right? Like my, my daily experience as CEO is, is a very different experience of key than, you know, the new floor hand in Williston, North Dakota. And so um, you have to go be able to put yourself in their place to, to understand you know, how was your onboarding? How was this? How was that? Um, because everything you're, you're going to hear in that in, in your chair is going to be by the people who put it in place. So um, you can't you can't fix what you don't know is broken. Um, and if, if you don't get out of the cave, you're just going to be that mushroom in the cave being fed the BS. And so you got to kind of come out into the sunlight sometimes and, and see what's going on. I am, I don't know about you, Marcel, but I'm just so glad that he shared that, Marshall, because I, I had never that, heard of it before, but I, I feel it in all different aspects. Like it is so incredibly true. Um, and sometimes even in the roles that, you know, you're in throughout your career, you're part of creating that quote unquote BS as you're like creating how we're going to talk to an executive about what's going on. You know, before we end, do you have any advice on like, do you ever see that changing or is that just business? I think that's just human nature. I yeah. think that is just human nature. And that is business. That's that's any kind of large organization. You know, none of us want to deliver bad news. None of us want to uh, be the ones to say, you know, I have, we cannot get this right. Right. Like you don't go tell that to your boss's boss boss. Mm -hmm. Um but you know your boss's boss boss may have a different perspective, but wants to understand what's not working, mm -hmm. um, so that you can, you know, you may need a different resources. You may need a different kind of team member um, to to get it right. So it's it's important, kind of going back to what I said, you know, saying those things that you don't want to say, um, mm -hmm. and making sure that that's out there, mm -hmm. um, because otherwise you can't address it as a team. But that, that's just human nature. <laughs> Yeah, I think what makes it easier, though, is depending on the leader. And if you're someone that people can bring their failures to and be open about their their challenges and how they failed, but how they're going to fix it, etc. I think that's what creates a little bit more of that safer environment where they feel that, that there's going to be support versus mm -hmm. we're going to get fired. And that's also not great because then you're so scared of failing because you think you're going to get fired that 
you're not doing that great of a job anyways, and you're gonna have to lie to the top of the organization, which yeah. doesn't benefit the CEO or the VPs either. So it's, it's kind of like creating that healthy balance of being open to failures, but also like, don't fail, you know? Yeah, no, you can, you can, you can only manage through fear for so long, right? Well, you know, fear and money work. Don't get me wrong. They, they definitely work, but they don't last. And uh, you, you eventually burn people out. Having, having been in the environment where you walk in with bad news and you get screamed at, right? You know, I didn't do that. You know, I'm, 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 I'm the, the financial person telling you the results. Why are you yelling at me? Right. Um, but but we've we've all been there. And uh, I, I, I tried to not create that kind of environment because I, I'm a big believer in the team approach and empowering the, our, our employees and really getting that diversity of, uh, of opinion and view, because not all the good ideas come out of Houston. So I Marshall, incredible, incredible advice incredible just knowledge throughout the struggles that you had faced in the beginning, how you overcame them, and then to become CEO and then to utilize all your learnings and your leadership style really speaks volumes, not to mention we hear it across social media on posts on how the culture has changed at key. And you are definitely, you know, a, a part of that. You're really behind that. And so we just really appreciate you know, leaders like yourself that are really changing the industry and really having that diversity of thought at the forefront. So thank you so much for coming on and sharing your journey with us. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for what y'all are doing for the industry and for women in the industry. I think it's a great thing. Uh, I, I listen to your podcasts um, and see your posts. So uh, y'all are doing amazing work. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Marshall. And if you liked this episode, please review, like, subscribe, find us on our website. We'll have all of Marshall's info there along with his write-up. Um, and we hope to catch you on the next one. Thank you.